swear by your glory. He still believes in Allah. The shaitan does believe in Allah. But he's defiant. لَهُمْ صِرَاطَكَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ I shall wait for them on the crossroad, on your main path. I will wait for them. To do what? To manipulate them. To deceive them. To seduce them. To play with their mind. ثُمَّ لَآتِيَنَّهُمْ مِنْ بَيْنِ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَمِنْ خَلْفِهِمْ وَعَنْ أَيْمَانِهِمْ وَعَنْ شَمَائِلِهِمْ I shall approach them from before, from front, from behind, from their right and from their left. I shall circle them. I shall manipulate them and I shall attack them from every angle. وَلَا تَجِدُ أَكْثَرَهُمْ شَاكِرِينَ and you will not find most of them, humans, grateful to you. So, today I would like to talk a little bit about the nine tactics that the shaitan uses to manipulate humans. He uses nine tactics. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had warned us in the Quran about all his tactics. The first tactics he uses, my dear brothers and sisters, is to adorn things for us. To adorn things means he makes them look good. In order to tempt us to do something bad, he would make sure that the bad thing I'm going to embark on looks nice, looks appealing. He sugarcoat. I always use this example. He sugarcoats to us. Our kids are reluctant to take the medicine because it doesn't take, taste good. So what pharmaceutical companies did, they played a trick on our children. They added some sugar into the medicine so our kids would be tricked. They take it happily. Before the same child, you want to give him this medicine, he will give you a hard time. Now you give him the same exact Medicine with sugar added on it, he takes it happily and he smiles in your face. It's the same medicine, but with sugar added. That's why they call it sugar coating. When the shaitan is about to strike, he sugar coat to you. He makes things look nice and appealing. And I give some examples on that. When the shaitan is about to, for example, convince you not to pray. I am someone, conscientious, conscientious, I'm someone who never missed a prayer. He cannot come and tell me, don't pray to Allah. That sounds very ugly and very unpleasant and so defined. What does he tell me in order to convince me not to pray? He does not come during the Dhuhr prayer, or Asr prayer, or Maghrib prayer. He comes at a time that I'm so vulnerable in the morning prayer. I'm sleeping, I'm enjoying my sweet sleep. And now, when I wake up to pray, he comes and he whispers in my ears, go back to the bed, there is still time for the sun to rise looks appealing he doesn't tell me don't pray he tells me there is time for you so still enjoy your sleep so I go back to sleep what happens 30 minutes later I'm asleep I will miss my prayer when I am about to give charity to someone to a poor family the shaitan will never tell you don't give don't give why because that will make me feel I am so stingy. I'm so cheap. And I don't want to feel I'm cheap. How to discourage you? He will come and tell you, why in a hurry? Tomorrow? Wait till tomorrow. Yeah, I don't have cash with me. Inshallah, tomorrow I will have my credit card. And then I forget. Or he may come and tell me, yeah, it's true, this is a poor family. But look at your children. They want to go to college in three years. Your children deserves this money. 
Does anybody doesn't believe that my children deserve the money? This is the way he adorns my stinginess to me. So I am being stingy, but he does not sell it to me as a stingy. He sells it to me as someone protective of my children and their future. That's how he adorns. He adorns things, my dear brothers and sisters, always. When a young woman is about to put hijab, she's contemplating, should I put hijab or not? He would come and tell her, inshallah, you go to hajj. And you know when you go to hajj, Allah forgives all your sins. So why? Why the rush? Wait for a few more years. You go to hajj. Allah will wash off all your sins. Plus, you're young now. If you wear hijab, the uh, marriage prospect will be reduced for you. Number three, you have a beautiful hair. Let people see it. How fine it is. How beautiful it is. Why you want to hide something? A gift given to you by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Makes sense, doesn't it? To some people, that makes sense. That's how he adorns sinning to us. So, that's one way. His first technique. The second one, taswif. Procrastination. Every time I'm about to do something good, he will tell me, no rush, wait. Every time. You know, I missed a few days from last year Ramadan. I have only till March 21st to make them up. And every day I say to myself, let me make them up. He will come and tell me, you still have three weeks. You still have three weeks. Today there is a dinner at this place. You're invited for dinner. Enjoy your day today, inshallah, tomorrow. But then tomorrow he would tell me the same thing. He would tell me, you still have three weeks. Time is running up. And I am delaying my decision. That's one technique that he will use also. To convince you to delay things you're supposed to do today till tomorrow. But then tomorrow never comes. When tomorrow happens, he will use the same tactics. He will tell me, you still have time. And I, then I go, all of a sudden I realize Ramadan is tomorrow. And I missed my time to make up. And then I will say, what a bad mistake I made. I had 365 days to make up. I continued. Delaying and delaying and delaying. Who is pushing me? Who is manipulating me? It is the shaitan. Number three, his ninth, his ninth tactic is, uh, Hajj Karl is counting them, right? Hajj Karl. And after I go home, he says, good job. You mentioned them all today. And I, if I miss one or two, he would go for three months rebuking me that you missed the last two, three. So I'm trying to catch up and mention them all. al -waswasa. He whispers. He whispers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the last chapter in the Quran, an nas Surah An-Nas, قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ I seek Refuge to the one who is the Lord of all people. قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ مَلِكِ النَّاسِ He is the king of all people. إِلَاهِ النَّاسِ He is the Lord of all people. مِنْ شَرِّ الْوَسْوَاسِ الْخَنَّاسِ الَّذِي يُوَسْوِسْ بِصُدُورِ النَّاسِ I seek refuge to him from the whispering of the whisperer. Who whispers? It is the shaitan. He just whispers. He casts an idea in your heart. He just says something. And then we take it. It is the bait that he casts. And sometimes we easily take it. So, my dear brothers and sisters. Shaitan plays with our mind. With our brain. And he casts idea. 
Sometime you lose something. You live with someone that you trust, a roommate. You come to your room and you find $100 bill missing. And you know this person. You know him very well for 20 years. Then the shaitan all of a sudden he casts an idea in your mind, in your heart. It is your roommate. And you say, Astaghfirullah, why am I thinking this way? Who is putting this idea in your mind, in your heart? It's the shaitan. He whispers. All of a sudden you start suspecting your own roommate. You start suspecting your wife. A woman I have not seen anything bad coming from her for 30 years, 20 years, I start suspecting. All of a sudden I find the $100 bill in my car and I say, Astaghfirullah, I suspected this innocent person. That's how he casts thoughts in your heart. The prophet was walking one day with one of his friends in the street when he met a lady and he started speaking to her. The prophet asked his friend for permission to finish speaking to this lady. After finishing, he came and he says to his friend, that was my wife. The man says, Ya Rasulullah, of course, of course. I would never suspect. He says, no, you do suspect. Don't tell me. Don't tell me. You do suspect. Inna shaytan yajri fi ibn Adam majra dami fil uruq. Shaytan runs in our veins like blood running in your veins. That's how he does. Even with the Prophet. Even with the Prophet, some people would doubt. Who puts that idea that the Prophet is speaking to a lady who is not supposed to speak to? It's the Shaytan. So the Prophet gave that example that <clears throat> be careful of the Shaytan casting thoughts on your mind. Don't take the bait. Number four. He promises you. He promises you. I have mentioned this story before. When some friend of mine asked me to visit a terminally ill person who had cancer to convince him to write his will. I went, I sat by him, and I explained to him that it is best for him to write his will before dying. And he says, he listens to me and he says, say, don't bother yourself. When I become well, which I will become well, I will come to your office and ask you to write my will. I left. Next day, exactly next day, my friend who took me to his house calls me and he says, but he passed away. Why he said, I will come to you? You think he was lying? No, because the shaitan was telling him, I promise you, you will live long. You will live long. You will pass this stage. You will be okay. Cancer will not kill you. <laughs> he would promise him that you will live long enough. He would not show him the reality that death could be within your span. It could be a split of second away from you. He would not make you see that. He would ya'iduhum wa yumanihim. He would tell him, look, life is not that short. You will be okay. You will survive this cancer and you will go. Don't rush. What else? Number five. وَيُرِيدُ الشَّيْطَانُ أَنْ يُظِلَّهُمْ ضَلَالًا بَعِيدًا Sometime, in order to manipulate us, what does he do? He confuses us. 
He confuses us. How he confuses us. He brings an idea that can cause division and can make people go for it. Someone who is following the path. He is following the path. But all of a sudden, there will be a confusing point where this person would back down. So, he would make people go astray by causing and sowing confusion in the community. That is one technique he uses. To cause confusion among people not to follow the right path. So the Prophet, for example, announced in the day of Ghadir, Imam Ali is the successor. All Muslims accepted. There were a few who rejected. One of them, an naman ibn al-Fahr, he came to the Prophet and he says, Ya Rasulullah, you ask us to pray, we did. You ask us to fast, we did. You ask us to pay zakat, we did. Now, you're coming to your cousin to make him our leader after you? Is that you? Being motivated by your personal interest, nepotism, or that is God? This is the confusion that the shaitan is causing. The man is following the prophet all along. All of a sudden, the shaitan causes him to be confused. The prophet is doing this for personal reason. He is appointing his cousin, Ali ibn Abi Talib. Oh, maybe he's doing this for, to keep this power in his household. That's how the shaitan causes confusion sometimes. But for someone to follow the prophet who believed in the prophet, I will go behind my prophet anywhere he takes me because I know he is a messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and nothing will confuse me and nothing will shatter the trust I have in him. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions number six, another tactics he uses. إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ الشَّيْطَانُ أَنْ يُوقِعَ بَيْنَكُمُ الْعَدَاوَةَ وَالْبَغْضَاءَ فِي الْخَمْرِ وَالْمَيْسَرِ he uses animosity. He uses animosity. Like what? When someone gambles, gambling will cause animosity. How? How so? When someone gambles, he will run out of money. When he runs out of money, he has no money to pay his bills. He has no money to pay his family's expenditure. His wife starts complaining the landlord starts complaining he will you know default then what's going to happen that will cause friction and animosity who is behind this animosity it is the shaitan who uses this animosity to get to his point number seven or eight actually i don't know i have to ask dr carol uh, number seven, insa, he would make you forget. He would make you forget. According to the Quran, <coughs> according to the Quran, when Yusuf, Prophet Yusuf, was in jail, and one of his jailmates was set free, that jailmate was the uh, the one who works at the royal palace, who gives the king his drink. He has a name in English. Dr. Khaled, do you know? The one who, who, who hands the drink to the king. Anyway, handler, call him the handler of the king. He went back to his job. He was wrongly accused of embezzlement, then his innocence was approved and he was acquitted. He went back to the royal palace. Yusuf told him, told his jailmate, 
when you go back to you, the king, remind him of my situation. Allah says, the shaitan made him forget. The shaitan made the jail mate to forget. Shaitan didn't want this jail mate to remind the king so Yusuf would be acquitted and set free from the jail. Many times you're about to pray. You're about to pray. It happened with me the other day. I am, I was coming from Washington. You see, my flight was at 6 a.m. Prayer was 5.30 a.m. <clears throat> so I made wudu at the hotel, knowing that at that time, when it's time for salah, I will be at the airport getting ready for boarding. 5.30, I said, I had my prayer mat ready. I said to myself, I'm going to pray first, then board the plane. It was going to be close to the time of boarding. 5.30 happens and they announce the boarding and I am now my pre, I am preoccupied with the boarding announcement and I enter the plane before praying at the gate. When did I remember? Once I am in my seat. Once I was in my seat. Alhamdulillah, I did a prayer by the way. Don't think I missed my prayer. But I was planning to pray at the gate because praying in the gate will allow me to pray in full, standing, doing rukur. But in my seat, while I am seated in my own seat, I cannot stand up. So I had to pray while I am sitting in my own seat, which I did. But the shaitan made me forget in that 20 minutes window to pray at the gate. I was preoccupied with the announcement. The shaitan made me forget. I entered the, I boarded the plane, and ultimately I had to, which is fine. But my point is, sometime you are planning on doing something good, and all of a sudden you forget. Even though you're not the type of person who would forget these things, but you did forget. Who is behind it? It is the shaitan. Number nine. يَا بَنِي آدَمَ لَا يَفْتِنَنَّكُمُ الشَّيْطَانِ Don't let him deceive. Sometimes he deceives. Sometimes he deceives you. Utterly deceives you. How? Umar ibn Sa'd. Don't confuse him with Umar ibn al-Khattab. There are two Umar. Umar ibn al-Khattab was at the time of the Prophet. He is the second caliph. Umar ibn Sa'd was a war warrior. He was summoned by the ruler of his time to lead an expedition against Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Umar bin Sa'ad was reluctant. He didn't want to lead an expedition against Imam Hussein. He knows who Imam Hussein is. But in order to convince him to accept this responsibility, he tells him, look, if you accept this responsibility, I will announce you the governor of Ray. Ray is an area in current Iran today. Now, Omar had his eyes on the governorship of Ray. He wanted to be, so badly he wanted to be the governor of Ray. So the down payment to get to that wish of him to fulfill his wish was to lead an expedition. Ibn Ziyad realized how badly he wants to be the governor of Ray. He used that point. He used that tactic. He says, if you accept to lead an expedition against Hussein, I will appoint you afterward the governor of Ray. Omar ibn Sa'ad spent the whole night debating with himself. Should I accept this ugly responsibility? and lead an expedition against Hussein. And who is Hussein? Hussein is the son of the Prophet. Sayyidu Shababi Ahl al-Jannah. The master of heaven. The man who is viewed as a part of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. An extension of his grandfather. 
So when he thinks about it this way, he will be deterred. But then when he thinks about his desire, his burning desire to be the governor of Ray, he would be weakened and he would take a back seat. Finally, shaitan deceived him. Shaitan told him, even if you kill Hussein, what's going to happen? The door for repentance is wide open for you. Allah will forgive you. And he accepted. And he went. He killed Imam Hussein. But then he was not able to be the governor of Ray. He was killed by a revolutionist two years or one year and a half after the Battle of Karbala. And he took his wish, his dream, to his grave. He wasn't able to fulfill his dream. Number nine, istahwath, domination. When the shaitan dominates the person. When that would happen? That happens when Musa alayhi salam met the shaitan one day. And Shait Musa, Prophet Musa asked the shaitan the following question. فَأَخْبِرْنِي بِالذَّنْبِ الَّذِي إِذَا أَذْنَبَهُ بْنُ آدَمْ إِسْتَحْوَثْتَ عَلَيْهِ Tell me which, which sin a human being may commit that if he does so, you will be able to completely dominate him. قَالَ الشَّيْطَانِ إِذَا أَعْجَبَتْهُ نَفْسُهُ When he flatters himself and he will be happy with his own performance. And when he looks at his own deed and he says, mm, I have done so many good deeds. And when he belittles his sins, many people belittle their sins. Why do you lie? It's okay. It's a big, small sin. I didn't commit a big sin. I didn't drink. I just made a small lie. Small lie here. Small lie there, and all of a sudden, the person is dominated by the shaitan. Allahumma khfir lil mu'mineen wal mu'minat, wal muslimin wal muslimat, al ahya'i minhum wal amwat, tabi' allahumma baynana wa baynahum bil khayrat, inna ka mujib al da'awat, inna ka qadhi al hajat, inna ka ala kulli shay'in qadir. I remind you, my dear brothers and sisters, that next Sunday, the time will change. The time, the uh, day, uh, uh, daylight saving, time will change. But our time here will not change. Meaning, we will still meet at 11, the new time. So, the lecture time will not uh, uh, change, even though the daylight time saving will be changing next Sunday. Uh, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless you all, to protect you all, and... Uh, I encourage you one more time for those who have not purchased their ticket for, the, for our uh, annual dinner, please go ahead and buy your tickets and make sure you attend our dinner on March uh, 19th at 3 p.m. at Vintage Bell Cultural Center. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa